Good morning, guys. Y'all look awesome today. All right, so it's not a normal thing that I, um, that I sing and then I jump right into this position, but this is happening not because this is the best plan, right? Uh, this is not the smartest thing to do. No, this is happening because we have um, our, our lead pastor, Tyler, he's on vacation. Uh, Brian's out um, because Kimberly is out. Justin is filling in and, and River Kids for her. So there's a lot. And then, um, you know, there are a lot of team members that are out the aisles, are out of town. So super thankful that we have some people that are able to get away and just um, hoping that they have some good rest and some good time away. But um, as a result of all of that, you have me all morning. So I know. That's not what I was not fishing. I was not, I was not fishing. Um, so we are in a series on Philippians, uh, daily and lifelong decisions. The, the, the thought behind this is um, how do we become, how do we start to live out some things that, that, that Paul talks about in Philippians because he, he says some really amazing things. And it's not just these, these little, you know, he doesn't just say them without thought. Like he's saying some statements that are pretty big. Um, and then we'll look at those statements today. But they're, they're not just things that belong on a Christian t-shirt. He just says to say, no, these are things that come from his life and his experience and a genuine conviction of how he feels and how we operate through a world that's not easy. So the goal is how do we start to emulate some of that? How do we start to follow some of that? I don't want to walk through these weeks real, real quickly, but um, week one, we talked about we're stronger together. That was the first deal. We're stronger together. Let's do this together. It's not about what we do. It's about who we are. Our identity is not as runners. It's as sons and daughters. So uh, Pastor Tyler talked about, um, and he's been using some running analogies, and I will, I'll attempt to use one as well, knowing that I'm not a, a, an avid runner. Um, we, we have, um, even though my pastor is, you know, he's like 20 years older than me, but he's incredibly good shape. I'm just kidding. He's not 20 years older than me. I'm not. Um, <laughs> But he, he, he can run forever. He, he's a very, very fit guy. And it, it makes sense for him to talk about running. So it'll be a little silly for me to talk about today because I have a dad bod. I don't have a runner bod. Um, but it's fine because we'll just keep, keep that going. But he used illustration. So the, our identity is not as a runner. Our identity is sons and daughters. So running is just something we do to become a, that, that helps us become a better son and a, and, and, a, and a better daughter. It's not who we are. It's just it's something that we do. Week two, it talks about our unity is Christ. Our unity in Christ is our influence. So we talked about the heart muscle, about how to build that. So and we asked the question, how strong is our heart muscle? Because it's not about uh, unity happens whenever our hearts are aligned with Christ and our hearts are, are in Him. And it's not about us or about somebody else. And that's whenever, you know, friction happens or, or, or things become weird. Our, our unity is in our, 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 our influence in our, is in our unity in Christ. How unified is our heart with Christ? Not with this world, not with ourselves, but with Christ. Um, week three was amazing. If you didn't see that, all of them were good. But last week was really awesome. Um, a really good friend, John, was up here and he gave his testimony. It was absolutely powerful. And um, the idea that day was we want to make the most of Christ. And he said this thing that I love. He said, I just held onto the cross and I didn't let go. I love that. How do you make the most of Christ? You go to what he did. You go to his sacrifice. You go to, to that, that cross moment. You hold on to it and you hold on to everything that represents. You just don't let go and you just make some really tough and really bold decisions based off of the strength you find and the forgiveness that we have in Christ, the, the demonstration on the cross. Um, today, the big idea is this. Make the most of the joy of knowing Christ. Make the most of the joy of knowing Christ. So we're going to talk about that. And first, I want to say, like, I got the wobbly tail today. Like, usually people take time when, like, there's, like, a real speaker and they, like, get, like, the nice tables. So we're going to be wobbling all morning. So it's, it's fine. I'm just the worship pastor. It's fine. It's, it'll work. Anybody have a cell phone I can put under here? I can. Um, make the most of the joy of knowing Christ. So how do we experience that joy? Make the most of the joy of knowing Christ. So here's the deal. We're talking about this because being a person marked by joy is a big deal. We don't want to be marked by a person that complains. We don't want to be marked by a person that's jealous. We don't want to be marked by a person that is, is always talking bad or is always negative. We want to be, when you think about the people that you want to be around, you want to be like, do you think about the grumpies? Do you think about the people filled with joy, right? We want to be a, a, a people marked. Well, that's too soon. You don't need to give that away yet. It's too soon. <laughs> Our goal is to be a person marked by joy. So how do we get to that? 
Joy can be easy when life is good, right? We can experience it whenever things are good. Can we just, just get on the same page with that? Whenever we're, things are good, it's easy to experience that. Um, it gets harder though whenever life gets tough. Can we agree on that? That's right, right? So when it gets hard, so what, what do we, so this is what Nate does. When life gets hard, I become a victim. I become a poor me. I become a look at my life, like things are hard. Like I start to, and, and, a, and a little later, we'll, 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 we'll start to compare um, some things that, that we often feel makes us feel like justified in being a victim. And then we'll look at Paul and what he went through and, and, and the fact that he never did that. But um, the joy of Christ is, is, it's found in everyday moments. Um, and, and just really normal activities. Um, but we, we can all agree that the harder life gets, the harder it is to experience that joy and to express that joy. Um, the big t- faith testing moments are not usually a decision made in the moment. So here's the deal. Whenever we get a, a moment where it squeezes us or it tries us and, and it's, it's really difficult and tough, typically um, those moments are not the moment that we respond the best because that's the only time that we're thinking about it. Usually. It's different. Um, so here's the illustration I'm going to use. This is Tyler. Help me think through this. Elite runners don't run. Um, they don't race often. They put their marks and their sights on a big event, on a big race. Um, they don't run a lot of races, but what they do is they um, they train for a specific event. And here's here's what happens. We're just going on a long life, and maybe I don't know. You watch a bunch of runner events. I don't know. I don't. Um, but but maybe you do. And and but out of nowhere, there's this big event, and this 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 person comes out, and this person is crazy fast. And out of nowhere, they just they just go and they run. It wasn't just that day that they stepped into that that arena and they started running. There was a lifetime. There was day in day out, moment by moment, training, focusing, training, focusing. They weren't running race after race. They were training for that big event, and then out of nowhere, it's there. That, that that's the the thought that we're thinking about here. That's what I want us to get to whenever we leave today. It's not about we're just people and we're not thinking about life. We're just going through and life is happening to us. And then big moments happen. Like, oh, I have to really like grin and bear it. And I have to really like white knuckle it. And I have to be a good person now. I have to respond well. I want us to undo that and to relax um, because that can set us up for some failure because we see people that um, handle those moments beautifully and we think, you know, if, if I get to that moment and I can't handle it beautifully, if I can't experience this joy that I should be marked by, then I'm obviously not as good of a person. I don't think that's true. Um, the joy of knowing Christ is most apparent when the big and hard um, life moments happen. These moments are the game. These moments are the arena. These moments are the event. Just like these elite runners that, that train and train and train for that event, these moments, these big things that we don't really know when they're gonna happen, but those are the game. Those are the moments. And our response to these moments are a result of everyday decisions to follow Jesus. Every single day, moment by moment. And most often, these moments are unseen. These moments are mundane. These moments are small and seemingly insignificant. But they're done day in, day out, time after time, consistently, over and over and over, and it turns into something. Years of praying to and resting in Jesus go unnoticed. Years of this go unnoticed, but these decisions are the ones that build to become the big moments of life. People that we, we admire, I talked to this a little bit earlier, people that we, we admire um, have developed a daily habit of making these decisions. So when I say... Who is someone in your life that has been influential, who has displayed this kind of of character that that we're talking about? Who comes to mind? Whenever you think about who is somebody that has demonstrated joy in the middle of really tough situations, somebody that I'm like, if I was there, I don't know that I would respond that way. If I ever get there, I would hope that I would be the, half the person that, 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 that they were. Who, is, who, is the, the, who are the people in your life that come to mind? Um, as I was thinking through this, a couple came to my mind. I'm in, a, I'm in an, an amazing small group and, and one of my really good friends is your elder, Matt Fogel. And he's told this story over and over about his mom. Um, and I just wanted, I asked him permission to share the story. So I just want to read this story. But this is, this is, this is his account of, of his mom whenever, whenever she was, he was passing away. This is, this is Matt saying, my mom's name was Billie Jean Fogel. She was diagnosed with ALS in February, 2011. 
She passed away October 31st, 2013. The main thing that my mom always wanted was for people to see Jesus through her experience with ALS. Most people who came across that had the same diagnosis, were often negative and blamed God or the world for their circumstances. My mom was never negative through the whole process. She loved telling her nurses and medical attendants about Jesus. She wore a blanket with the name Jesus in big letters for all to see. I once asked her if she was angry with God or if she wondered why God would um, allow her to go through this. My mom said, why not me? That always amazed me. In the midst of these horrendous afflictions, she, she could focus on Jesus and the fact that she was a child of God. That was where she found her identity. She was such an amazing example of loving and focus on Jesus despite her circumstances. I will never forget that. He shared that story with me several times. Um, it's just a, a picture of an amazing person in his life demonstrating joy under incredibly difficult circumstances. And that, 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 that stuck with him in a really, really big way. So I asked him a follow-up question, what do you attribute, like, like what, what was it about her that gave her that kind of strength and character and joy? And, and he said he, he consistently saw her spending time in prayer, in the Bible, in God's word, with Jesus day in, day out. He, it was a habit of hers. It was something that she did over and over and over. So when she got to that big game, she had already trained. When she got to that big game, she, she, she ran out of that gate, out of, out, of the, out of the start line, and she blew everybody else away because she was ready. She was training. I have a really close friend. His name is Sam Letts. Letts and I also asked for permission for this story, but he's a pastor over in... Um, I, I, maybe Valencia now, I can't remember, but he, him and I served together in St. Petersburg back in 2009. And he, um, we were serving at a church over in St. Petersburg and we became close. And this is something kind of a weird thing that happens with staff members whenever they move to a new area. Um, I, um, this was before Amy and I got married and Fred kids, so I, you know, it was just me. But a weird thing happens whenever you move to a new area that you end up kind of, to save money, you end up like living with a staff member. That's happened with several staff members that moved here. It's kind of a weird thing, but you become roommates with, with people on staff. Um, I did that with, with, with him and his family and we became incredibly close um, and, and became really close friends. Uh, not too long when I was there serving, Sam Letson developed tongue cancer as a pastor. Never um, had tobacco in his life, never smoked cigarettes, never did any, I mean, just an amazing, just, just a really, really clean living guy. Um, and he developed tongue, tongue cancer and he, you know, it's scary, even just, just cancer is scary in and of itself, but he's a pastor. His job is to communicate and to speak and he thought it was over. And he thought his, so, they moved to treatment and they removed a third of his tongue to get rid of the cancer and went through severe radiation, severe, um, just all, all, all the medication, just completely. Um, I watched this, this dear friend of mine just completely almost waste away to nothing. But all through it, I saw him um, never get angry with God, never questioned, never even, it didn't matter how sick he was, it didn't matter how hard it was to move on. He was there and he loved Jesus and he loved people around him. And he wasn't perfect. It wasn't like, it was like, you know, roses and, and, and best day of my life. He didn't wake up saying that, but he had this joy inside of him that was not shaken. And that's something that slipped an impression on me. I remember that about him because, because he showed up to the game and he didn't know when the game was gonna happen, but he showed up. And because he was training, he was ready he shot out of, of that, that start line and he beat everybody else. He ran fast because he was ready, because he did the training, he put in the time. So we've been looking at the letter of Philippians and the life of Paul. And we just talked about a few examples of people who, who were marked by joy. So let's look at Paul. Let's go to that slide that, that we, we, we just saw a second ago. This is the context of Paul's life whenever he was, he was writing Philippians. Not that, like, this is, this is the, the reality of him as a follower, as a minister of the gospel. Paul was put in prison over and over. Paul was flogged an uncounted number of times. Paul faced death over and over. Paul received 39 lashes from the Jews five times. Paul was beaten with rods three times. Paul was stoned one time. Paul was shipwrecked three times. Paul spent a day and night at the sea, in, in, in the sea. Paul was in continual danger from rivers and robbers. 
was in danger from his own countrymen as well as the Gentiles, was in danger in the city, in the country, in the sea, and from false brothers, was weary in pain, often without sleep, was often hungry and thirsty, cold and naked, and was continually concerned about the health of all of the churches. So here's the deal. That was Paul's experience here on earth as somebody who was surrendering and saying yes to Jesus. He was doing what God wanted him to do, and that was his reality. I read that, and I think about the things that happened to me and how quickly I moved to being a victim. And then I start to feel really shameful and guilty. And like, like, so if Paul went through that, and if he just merely, it wasn't even about like this big joyful guy and like said all these amazing things. If he just like, just, just stuck with it. And just like, if even, even if he was grumpy and just like kept the, the ball moving, like it would be like, okay, the guy's not insane. He's not like in the corner in the, fe- corner in the fetal position crying. Like, like he's not doing that. He's doing really well. But he went beyond that to being one of the most influential people in this world. Apart from Jesus, I would, I would argue, and, and, and Pastor Tyler said, one of the most influential. Paul was never a victim. There's never a moment whenever you go through his letters where he is the victim. And he, I feel like he had some right to be the victim, right? That, that, that was some pretty tough stuff happening to him, but he was never the victim. How much does it take for me to become a victim in my own life? Let's reverse that. I don't know what kind of shoes you wore today. I don't want to step on your toes, but reverse that. How much does it take in your life to feel like the victim? And I'm not minimizing things that have happened in your life. Because there's some, with the, with, the, with the crowd this side, there have been some really emotionally, physically, relationally devastating things that have happened to you. I'm not diminishing that at all. But we're talking about how do we get ready for the game? These moments are the game. These moments are the event. How do we get ready for that? And how do we respond in a way that looks more like this and less like what we usually do? I'm going to read through Philippians 4. Um, the text won't be up here in, in, in its entirety. Um, I'm just going to read through it. I want you to listen to it. I'm, re- I'm going to read the entire chapter. And I, I want to do that because I want you to get in context what Paul felt like. Where was his mindset? This is that list that we just saw. That was the context of his life here on earth. But his response to his life is not how I would respond so I just want to read this chapter. We'll go through and we'll, we'll, we'll put up a, a few verses later. Some, we'll point, pull some things out. But I want to read the entire chapter. So just listen along. Philippians 4, chap, uh, verse 1. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends, for you are my joy and the crown are received from my work. Now I appeal to Euodia and since. Sintichi, I practice those, still, still butchered them. Please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others about the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace with which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. How I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned to be content in whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. 
Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you to the good news and then traveled on, on from Macedonia. No other church did this because I did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. The moment I have all I need and more, I am generously supplied with the gifts you sent me with Epaphrodites. Epaphrodites. They are sweet smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his gracious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now all glory to God, our Father, forever and ever. Amen. Give my final greetings to each of God's holy people, all who belong to Jesus Christ. The brothers who are with me send you, send you their greetings and all the rest of God's people send you greetings too, especially those in Caesar's household. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit. Does that sound like the temperament of a man who has experienced all that he's experienced? To me, it doesn't. It sounds like a man who is full of joy and full of longing and full of love and full of wanting the best for the people. Um, whenever he was in Philippi and he planted his church, that's where he was arrested and, and beaten and put in jail and then had a worship service that night. And you know, you, you know that story, all the, all the doors came open and he ended up witnessing to the guards. And so when he started this, 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 this church, it, it started out of pain and difficulty. And when he's writing it, he's not writing it, he's, he's writing from, from house arrest, but he is arrested. He, he is, he, he's incarcerated. He really doesn't know for sure what his outcome will be. But this is a man who is writing and saying some amazing things. So if he was a band, he would have some greatest hits. And I think a lot of his greatest hits would be in this, in this. Look at this. Verse four, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. I can't hear this without going to like how I learned this as a kid. Rejoice, Lord, always. And again, I say rejoice, right? That's how I memorized it as a kid. Rejoice, Lord, always. And again, I say rejoice in everything. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Whenever you're hurt, whenever you're beaten, whenever you're, you're discredited, whenever people that you thought loved you um, go behind your back and, and, and completely, completely just dismantle the relationship and, and hurt you, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The next one, verse six, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything, pray about everything. All these things are not meant to be things that we fixate on and worry about. They're supposed to be something that, that, we, that we pray through. Uh, verse seven, then you'll experience God's peace, which ex exceeds anything we can understand. This is something we've said a lot, the peace that passes understanding. That's something that, that's available to us as children, as sons and daughters of the Most High God. We have this peace that, that exceeds anything that we can understand, which means we can be in a moment. We can be in the game. We can be in the middle of the event and it looks like we are done, yet we can experience a peace. This is the kind of peace that Paul he didn't just write it to go onto a coffee mug or a bumper sticker or a t-shirt. He was speaking out of his experience. This is how he experienced his father, his relationship with Jesus. That's, that was a reality to him. Peace that passes understanding. Verse eight, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. He doesn't think about all the bad stuff. He doesn't think about the things that happened to him. He doesn't think about which, how often do we, and, and I, I'm not, <laughs> counseling is good. It's good to go to, to, to a counselor and to, and, and, and to have somebody speak into your life. But how much time do we spend talking about the bad things that happened to us and fixating on that and fixating on that whenever we should be fixating on the things that are honorable and noble and true? I, 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 I talk to my daughter all the time. She... Um, 
She's afraid of thunderstorms. She's afraid of, honestly, she's afraid of being alone. She hates to go to a room and go to sleep because she just wants to be with us. Um, but she comes up with these fears and these reasons not, not to be alone. And I talk to her all the time. You need to think about things that are true. What's not true is that you're unsafe and that something will happen to you. Um, what's true is that you are loved, that you're protected, you're in a home, you're safe, you're in the safest place in your life. You're up in your bed, under your covers. I, I speak to that, speak of that into her all over and over and over and over. But the thought is thinking about things that are true, thinking about things that are, are, are honorable, right and pure and lovely. What are we spending time putting, um, setting our minds on? Um, and then maybe this would be the top hit. I don't know, but verse 13, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And I can't hear that without thinking I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. That's how I memorized it. And you know, that's, that's, that's definitely, you know, tagline worthy. That's definitely hashtag worthy. That's definitely like, you know, that's said over and over and over. And that's been um, adapted to, sporting events and just it's, it's been done over and over and over but did you catch it whenever you read this whole verse this whole chapter in its context when he got to that it has nothing to do with winning something right it has nothing to do with 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 him getting his way or or being able to do incredible feats no it had to do with in the context he's like right before that he said i i've learned to be content with almost nothing and i've learned to be content with when i have everything I've learned to, to, to be content in all these scenarios. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He's talking about his ability to have joy in every circumstance. And that joy comes from Christ who's giving him strength. So these are things that Paul says about his life that are, are true of, of how he interacts with his father, how his relationship fleshes out. Um, with his God. And um, we are here because we want to be people who are marked by joy, not by complaining, not by negativity, not by, um, and, and there are many things that we experience this life and we could respond poorly and it would be completely justified in this world's eye. In fact, the world might even encourage us, you need to respond that way because you deserve it. Um, this is different. This is a different way of looking at life and thinking. And, and, and when Paul went through everything that he went through, he came out of it focusing on Jesus and the truth that he has as a son of the most high God. The truth that if this world takes away my life, then I'm gonna be in the presence of my savior. And that's really good. And if I'm here, then I, I'm, I'm here to do the work and I'm here to be, to be molded by him and to, be, to, be, to, to grow into who he wants me to be. But I'm also here to equip the church and I'm here to, to cheer others on to be who, they, um, who, who God wants them to be. And he's like, he has that mindset. And, and at that point, what can the world do to him? They can beat him. They can, they can threaten his life. They can do, they can... They can spread rumors about him. They can try to malign him. They can do everything. It doesn't matter because what can they take away? Every single moment that he has, he's living in surrender. And it's a moment where he's either here on mission, uh, pursuing what God has called him to pursue, or he's ready to step into eternity and see his Savior. And it changes who he is completely. There's this, um, there's this parable of a Chinese bamboo tree. And actually it's, Factually, it's not a tree. Like technically a, a bamboo is a grass. I don't know if you knew that. Like the, the species, it's not a tree. It's actually a grass, even though it grows really tall, all that stuff. But there's this parable of this, this Chinese bamboo um, that you may have heard, but absolutely have fallen in love with. It's this plant that you, you plant into the ground what, like you know, many others, it, you plant it to the soil and you cover it up and you start to nurture it. You start to do things, you start to water it and you start to do things to help cultivate growth. Um, but here's the deal, all throughout the first year, there's absolutely no evidence of growth above the surface. Nothing happens. You can't see anything, but you still water, you still act as if, you still 
um, do things to, to, to help its growth. And then you get into the second year and still the second year passes and there's absolutely no growth whatsoever. Nothing is seen, not even a bud, nothing is seen. So you continue, you have to make the, the choice, do I continue to, to work at this and to, even though I don't see it and I really don't know what's happening, maybe nothing's happening, maybe it's just a dud. Do I just rip it up and start over? No, you decide, okay, I'm gonna continue to work at it. So you continue to water it and continue to cultivate it, give it sun, give it all the things that, that, that it needs, assuming that, that it's good. And you go into the third year, into the third year, still no growth, nothing. No evidence whatsoever. It's just, it looks the same as the day that you put it into the, in, into the soil. And then you go into the fourth year and it finishes the fourth year and still absolutely nothing, no evidence. Nothing is coming through. Nothing is pushing up. There's no evidence that anything is happening. And then you go into the fifth year and something happens really, really quickly. In a matter of five to six weeks, this bamboo grows 80 to 90 feet. That's, that's like, you can, it's, it's said that you can almost physically like watch it grow. It's growing so fast. Here's the question that I have for you. Did the bamboo tree grow 80 to 90 feet in five to six weeks? Or did it take five years? What was happening, if there was no growth for the first five years and it shot up that fast, guess what would happen? It would just fall over. So what was happening under the surface whenever you couldn't see it? What was happening was it was taking roots deep into the soil. And there was growth happening, but it was growth that you weren't seeing. It was growth that was happening down. It was under the surface. And it was, it was, it was growing and it was becoming strong and it was strengthening. And it was, it was, we couldn't see a thing. There was no evidence whatsoever, but it was something was happening year after year after year after year. And whenever the game came whenever the event happened, whenever the growth happened, it happened fast and it happened quickly. And it was it happened in a way that, that there was a support system and it wasn't, it wasn't rock, it wasn't, it was sturdy and it could take the fast growth, but also the, 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 the size of the plant. I love this illustration because this is a beautiful picture of what it means to develop our spiritual lives because so often we do things and we work and we cultivate and we don't see any response. And we have year after year, we have the choice. Do I just give up? I don't see, I don't feel any change. I don't see anything happening. Do I just stop? Do I just give up? Do you just like rip it up and start over? Do I just throw my hands up and give up? Or do we continue to, to water and to do the things that we know will create growth? Do we continue to pray even though we don't feel like we're being heard? Do we continue to read God's word even though it's not an epiphany every single day and it's not life changing? Do we continue to be in community whenever it doesn't feel like it's, 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 it's convenient? Do we continue to do all the things that, that we know will encourage us and help us to grow? Do we continue to do those things when year after year it doesn't feel like anything's happening? The truth is something's happening. Something is growing inside of you and it's, it's a root system that's going down. You may not see it, you may not feel it, but something is happening through the consistency of the mundane, through the consistency of doing the work day in, day out. Something is happening, growth is happening. And whenever... It's time whenever your moment comes and you don't know when it's gonna come, then incredible growth will happen. Not because that moment you just, you just white knuckled it and decided I'm just gonna be good right now. No, it came because there were years leading up to this moment of you being faithful, of you being like Matt's mom, of you being like Pastor Sam Letson, of you being like Paul, day in, day out, deciding that I'm gonna train for this race. I don't know when it's coming. And then I, I don't even know if that I want it to come, but I know that life is, is this way. Life is, is hard and it's difficult and there's pain. And whenever that pain comes, I want to be a person marked by joy, not by victimhood. I wanna be a person who points people to a father and to a savior, not to me and to all of my tragedy and all of my pain and all of my hurt. I wanna point people to, to someone who is greater and better and good. 
For Paul, the struggle of the pain became the adventure. What if we took that philosophy? What if we decided that these, these, these difficult days, these, these painful things, or even the mundane, what if that's just a part of the adventure? A part of the grand scheme of shaping us into who we wanna be? Elite athletes do a lot of hard work before they see amazing results, a whole lot of work. So the big idea, make the most of the joy of knowing Christ. Make the most of the joy of knowing Christ. That's, that's our, our hope, that's our call. That's what we want to wrap our heads around more so today than whenever we, we came in. And this is the thought I want to leave with. The daily faithful unnoticed moments prepare us for life. The good and the bad, it all becomes a way to become closer to God. It can start this afternoon and then tonight and then tomorrow, the small moments, the mundane moments, the moments that we say today, I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna make some room for Jesus. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna surrender, not just on a day or just on you know, a certain event. I'm gonna surrender whenever my kids are driving me crazy. I'm gonna surrender when work is going nuts and it's stressful. I'm gonna surrender when I feel anxious because my, my, my world is just not how I, I want it to be. I'm going to surrender in all of these moments and I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna count it all joy and I'm, I'm going to lift it all to Him and I'm going to surround myself with people that are like-minded and that encourage me. I'm going to read God's Word knowing that every single time I read it, even though it's not a lightning bolt that just explodes and just becomes this, this epiphany moment, I'm gonna read knowing that every word that I read is a root going deeper into the soil that's going to prepare me for the growth that God has in store for me. And it's gonna create a system that will make me stable and sure. In Psalms 1, it talks about us becoming a tree planted by streams of living water that doesn't wither, that stands the test of time, that no storm can knock over. We're supposed to be trees that send its roots into the system, into the soil of who God is so that we can experience who He wants us to be. I wanna to go to verse eight and nine. This is how we're going to close out because th these are, all of what I've said is not just Nate coming up with a, with a, with a neat idea and trying to encourage. This is, this is where it comes from. This is what Paul says in verse eight and nine. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. It's important, right? He said one final thing. He wants us to hear it. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. We're not supposed to fix our thoughts on the fact that our life is hard. Again, I'm not diminishing hard life, guys. I, I've experienced hard life. My family has experienced hard life. I'm not diminishing pain, but there's a difference between walking through that pain and processing it in joy and trust in Him than becoming a victim and becoming completely consumed and obsessed with it. He wants us to fix our thoughts and our, our, our eyes and things that are honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you've heard from me and saw me doing then the God of peace will be with you. Isn't that a beautiful promise? The God of peace will be with you. When the game comes and life is hard and the event is there and you're faced with this thing that is hard and painful and maybe seemingly impossible, the God of peace will be there with you. How do we get that? Keep putting into practice all you've learned. Keep putting into practice. Keep, keep, keep. Tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's going to feel monotonous, boring, and mundane sometimes. Other times it's going to feel rich and it's going to feel, it's going to feel amazing. But the point is keep putting into practice doesn't mean that we do or don't do it based off of how it feels. We do it because we know it is the preparation that will get us ready for the race, for the game, for the event. We're gonna move into a time of response. And we're gonna sing a song in a moment called um, Christ Be Magnified. And it's talking about from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified. That's, that's our hope, that's our goal, that, 
that at the center of all we are and everything that happens in our lives, that he would be center. That in the moments of um, when our marriages are, are, are difficult, that Christ would be at the center. That the moment that, that our kids are not listening and that varies from if they're young or older and the consequences are small and greater. Like, like whenever life is hard, let's put Christ at the center. May he be magnified at the altar of my life. Whenever work is falling apart, whenever health is falling apart, whenever you find yourself pursuing something that is just wrecking your life and you can't stop it. In, in, in all these moments, all these moments, may Christ be magnified, may he be the center of that. All, of, of that. So in a moment, we're, we're gonna sing that song. We're gonna align our hearts with that truth and you can stay in your seats and you can worship along. You also can go and you can move and you can do, we have communion set up in, on, on both sides of the room. You can do that with family, by yourself, with a group of friends, remembering, align yourself with with what Christ has done, his sacrifice on our behalf and how he has made a way for us to be his. Uh, there will be some people up here at the crosses that would love to have a conversation. If there's something that God has stirred in your heart that you're like, you know what, that's something I, okay, God, I hear you. I need to do something different. I encourage you, walk to one of these people who would love the chance to pray with you and encourage you. That's all they wanna do. They wanna cheer you on. It'll make it easier to take that step, whatever that step is. You can also um, respond by, by, by worshiping through, through offering. Um, there's some baskets in the back. You can also do that through the worship guide, but that's a way that you can respond. You can surrender and you, you can give him everything. But right now, I just wanna pray for our time and just um, step into a time where we don't just hear some guy with a dad bod on stage talking, but we, we lean into God, our Father, who wants more than what this world has to offer for us. He wants more. He wants us to be people who shoot, who fire out of the finish line and blow everybody else away, not because of our accomplishment, but because of the time that we've spent in his presence day in, day out. Let's pray. God, thank you for this moment and for this time and for these amazing people. God, I thank you that... Um, that your word is true and that we read through Philippians and it is an incredible thought that Paul thinks this way whenever his life is seemingly not that way. So help us to have that mindset and help us today to start the discipline of, of, um, of watering and nurturing and doing the things that help us to be ready for what, what life is gonna throw at us. We wanna be marked by joy, nothing else. We wanna be marked by, by, by who you have created us and called us to be. So in this moment, help us in all these ways as we respond, help us to take a step closer to you, to surrender to you, to make some space, to make some room for you to move in our hearts and lives. We ask this in your awesome name, amen.